He was located in an aisleway in the store. Once discovered by police, Frank raised his hands in the air and proceeded to walk backwards towards the SWAT officers, no gun in hand. In a final nod to his downed fellow officer, Sergeant Adrian Drellis handcuffed Frank using Officer Tally's handcuffs. And it looks like we have an active shooter. 204 party down in front of the store. Does not match the shooter description. 204 possibly two parties down. We have multiple calls coming from inside of people that have uh, barricaded themselves inside. I just had another party that's upstairs, second floor, hearing shots. 204 and 295 are making entry. Unit full traffic. 204 got another party down just inside the door. The shooter is inside. He just shot at us twice. Copy, active shooter inside, shot at them twice. Officer down inside the building. 136, we're in gunfight, hold the radio. 136, still multiple shots being fired at us. It does not sound like an AK. We were taking multiple rounds. So far, potentially one gunman armed with a long gun, potentially near the back of the store. We can get some officers to set up in the rear. We have multiple people down. Or with the FD, we have multiple people down. We're going to need to airlift some people out of here. 213, description of shooter, 30s, white male, beard, wearing attack vest. Be advised, suspect armed with a rifle, unknown location inside. I need to push into that officer. He's about 30 yards inside the store, down. We cannot get to him. We have no known location of the shooter. We think he might be setting up an ambush. Start pushing slow, but be advised, we do not know where he is. He is armed with a rifle. Our officer shot back and returned fire. We do not know where he is in the store. Traffic, we're in contact with the suspect. Per intel from the suspect that was pulled out, he said he came here alone, nobody else inside, but originally we got a call that there were three shooters, so unknown on the validity. Frank was asked if there was another shooter, or if he acted alone. However, he flatly refused to answer the questions. Instead, he repeatedly asked to speak with his mother, he was taken to a nearby ambulance for treatments as his right leg was fully covered in blood. You see, Frank was shot in the shootout with police. The bullet that struck his leg went straight through. Frank's guns were located near the pharmacy inside the store, which was eerily still softly playing music throughout the store. Eyewitnesses later described Frank as laughing and mumbling throughout the ordeal. A police officer even heard the shooter laughing and said to another officer incredulously, quote, This guy's laughing at us. Frank was taken to the Boulder Community Health Foothills Hospital, where his gunshot wound was treated. Seven victims were located inside the store. Two were on the ground in front of the store, and one was found in the parking lot. The black Mercedes they found was registered to Frank's brother and contained a rifle case inside. About 20 people from the grocery store fled to a nearby cafe, where a server let them in and locked the door behind, waiting for the shooting to end. Some sought shelter at a local pizza shop. Several of the younger survivors assisted elderly customers out of the store and off the loading dock out of the rear entrance. A mother and son had just finished paying for strawberries when they heard the shots, so they raced from the store and hid behind a very large rock outside an apartment complex. After the building was cleared, police evacuated the store and placed survivors and witnesses on buses to transport them to a safe location. As survivors were escorted out, SWAT officers directed everyone not to look around or at the blood. There were bodies and blood everywhere. Frank did not have any drugs or alcohol on his person and did not appear to be under the influence or intoxicated. He wasn't out of his mind. Frank carefully and meticulously planned his attack. Only six days before the shooting, on March 16th, he purchased a Ruger AR-556 pistol and his sister-in-law confessed to police that on the day before the shooting, she saw Frank playing with what appeared to be a machine gun. He told his family that the bullet was stuck in the gun, and they immediately became unsettled about Frank recklessly handling a firearm inside their home, so they confiscated it from him. The following morning, March 22nd, 
Frank requested that his parents return the gun. He claimed that he intended to return it to the store where he bought it, and they believed him. However, as we are painfully aware, Frank never returned the gun. He instead chose to drive to the King Super's supermarket, 15 miles away from his family's home, and brutally attacked many innocent and unsuspecting people. Frank was so cool and collected before executing his plan. Make no mistake about it. This was a planned attack. Perhaps the site was random. Perhaps even the day was random. But Frank knew he was going to attack. He visited a shooting range not long before the shooting. He rented a gun there, but ultimately decided purchasing his own would be more prudent for what he intended to do. Frank purchased the gun, an AR-556 pistol, quite easily. The gun was described as looking like an AR-15, but it was truly a pistol version of the Ruger's AR-556 rifle. The pistol version is lighter than the rifle, and even less expensive. But as evidenced by this terrifying tragedy, it's just as deadly. As so many of the other shooters we've covered, Frank had no issue passing the requisite background check. The morning of the shooting, Frank stopped by his sister's house for a little bit, and even played with his nieces and nephews, whom he laughed and had a grand time with. Frank ate with his sister's family, before he morphed into a completely different person. One who could carelessly harm so many. 62-year-old Lynn Murray was an Ohio native who graduated from Mentor High School and went on to attend the Ohio State University. Lynn was well-traveled, and she lived in places like Florida and Ohio before finishing her career in Manhattan, New York. She retired as a photo producer, whose work was displayed in many well-known magazines, such as Marie Claire and Cosmopolitan. At the time of the shooting, she was inside the shopping center, collecting groceries for an Instacart order. Lynn is survived by her beloved husband John and her two children, a son Pierce and a daughter Olivia. Officer Eric Talley was 51 years old when his life was stolen from him. Despite his young age, Eric lived a full life, having earned a master's degree that led to a career in information technology before leaving his profession to enroll in the police academy at 40 years old. Immediately after graduating from the academy in 2010, he was hired by the Boulder Police Department. Sadly, that same year, Eric lost one of his best friends in a drunk driving accident. Eric was married to the love of his life, and together they had seven children, ranging in age from 7 to 20 years old. He loved his whole family, and was particularly close with his brother and sister. His entire family shopped at King Supers, and by the grace of God, none of them were there that day of the shooting, except for Eric, who pledged to protect and serve the community, and therefore, he raced towards the gunfire that everyone else ran from. That sacrifice cost Eric his life, but he will never be forgotten. 25-year-old Ricky Olds was a manager at the King Super Supermarket. She grew up in Lafayette, Colorado, and attended Centaurus High School. Despite a tough childhood, where she was raised by her grandparents, Ricky was incredibly independent with a sociable, fun personality. Her greatest joy was making others laugh and smile. She loved it so much that she was known to break out funny dance moves at work, just to make her co-workers laugh. Ricky also enjoyed experimenting with various hairstyles and colors, usually going with bright and bold colors. She will be deeply missed. 20-year-old Denny Strong was an employee at King Supers. He started there in 2018 as a shelf stalker. He was training to become a pilot, so the extra money helped him pay for fuel costs for all the hours he spent flying. Known as a steadfast, giving friend, Denny thoroughly enjoyed all things fast, at least all things fast moving, like motorcycles, dirt bikes, and he really adored old muscle cars. The loss of this caring young man 
will be felt immensely. Kevin Mahoney was a 61-year-old Canadian-born man who grew up in Crystal Lake, Illinois. His passion was traveling to national parks and Maui, Hawaii. Kevin was enthralled by the hospitality industry, and also an avid sports nut. He never missed one of his children's sporting events. Kevin is survived by his wife, Ellen, and two children, daughter Erica and son Drew. He will be greatly mourned. Suzanne Fountain was 59 years old when she was murdered. Born in Flemington, New Jersey, she moved to New York as a toddler. Suzanne was active in the theater community, and in 2018, she became a licensed Medicare insurance agent. She truly enjoyed helping seniors. It was her calling, and she was brilliant at it. Suzanne is survived by her son, partner, parents, and her siblings that include two sisters and two brothers. Suzanne will never be forgotten. 65-year-old Jody Walters was a bubbly personality and loved to talk to and help others. She previously co-owned a boutique called Applause in downtown Boulder before she went on to work for Island Farm, which is a clothing store she worked at for about six years before taking time off to care for her grandson. Jody will be missed by all that knew her. 51-year-old Terry Liker was a longtime employee at King Supers. She worked there for nearly 30 years and absolutely loved her job. Terry's favorite movie was Frozen, and she loved singing songs from the movie. A serious fan of UC Boulder, Terry is described by her loved ones as selfless and incredible. Everyone that knew her will miss Terry greatly. Trelana Bartkowiak, also known as Lana, was born in Grenada Hills, California, where she lived for a while before eventually moving to Colorado. 49 years old when she was killed. 49 years old when she was killed, Lana was the co-owner of a clothing and artist collective store called Umba. She was set to marry her fiancé Brian and was thrilled to start her life with him. Lana is survived by her mother, sister, three brothers, and Brian and she will be missed every single day. 23-year-old Nevin Stanisic was a technician with KD Service and was servicing the coffee maker at Starbucks when he was killed for no reason or cause. A quiet and unassuming young man, Nevin was an excellent role model for the younger children at his church, who he was a devout follower of. The son of Serbian immigrants who fled Yugoslavia in the 90s and is survived by his wife, parents, and younger sister. Nevin's loss will be acutely felt. Frank was born on April 17, 1999, in Raqqa, Syria. One of 11 children, he was only two years old when his family immigrated to the United States. The family moved around several times, living in a Denver suburb called Arvada, which is where he lived at the time of the shooting. At one point, the family lived in Aurora, Colorado, where the shooting took place during the movie The Dark Knight. They moved to an apartment in Denver next, and then a rental home in Arvada. In 2017, they moved to a large 3,250-square-foot home that was purchased for $634,000. One of Frank's siblings is listed as the homeowner. The family was well off having owned and operated a number of successful Middle Eastern cuisine restaurants. Frank attended a mid-sized high school called Arveda West High School from the spring of 2015 until graduation in 2018. He enjoyed science and particularly loved Stephen Hawking books. One classmate described Frank as someone who got along fine with other kids and seemed, quote, chill. On the other hand, he wasn't especially popular. He just seemed like a regular kid who wasn't overly antisocial or revered. Frank was on the wrestling team in high school and didn't appear to display any typical red flags until his senior year. In November of 2017, Frank was in class when he suddenly stood up and proceeded to punch another student, Alex Kimose, in the head. It was completely unexpected, yet brutal. Alex was bleeding from his mouth and nose and was vomiting. His right eye began to swell shut, 
and it 